Hey folks, today we're going to talk about the simple pendulum, which is the classic example for moving from straight line motion, which we're finished with now, into planar motion. And so it still keeps things simple because we're still only talking about a point mass that's moving within a gravity field. And that's really, a, a, really an important distinction to make because here we're talking about something that's fixed, let's say at point O, and then there's a mass at the end. And we are not discussing something that's a rigid body okay, where there's the mass acting at the center of mass of a rigid body. Okay? So we are, we are not, we're not talking about this. This is called a compound pendulum. Uh, so a compound pendulum is anything that has an extended rigid body because the mass is distributed along that rigid body. So instead, we're talking about a simple pendulum in which we have a mass that is being constrained by something that's massless. And so that, that something that's massless can be a string, it can be this uh, you know, fictional idea of a, of a, um, a, a rod that has no mass. Okay, we know these things have mass. But this is our, our theoretical concept. All right, so all we're going to do is we're going to derive the equations of motion of this pendulum, and we're going to stay within a coordinate system that we're all used to. We're going to use a Cartesian coordinate system to derive these equations. So let's get started. We're going to call this, this point mass point P, and it has a mass of mass M. We've already defined our, our location of our origin as point O. That's where the, the string or this massless rod is located or affixed to. And then it's a length L. And so in our steps we needed to sketch the system. Okay, now we need to identify the reference frame. And so for our reference frame we are going to make an inertial reference frame with an origin at point O. So label your reference frame, reference frame I. So we've got point P, we're on this uh, massless rod with a mass of M. We've defined our reference frame. We now need to annotate the direction of gravity. Gravity is going down. And now we need to define our coordinates. And so our, for our coordinates, we're going to use a Cartesian coordinate system because we all like Cartesian coordinate systems. We like X and we like Y. So let's create an X and a Y. So we have our coordinate here that defines the horizontal position, coordinate X. And then we have a coordinate that defines the vertical position. And we'll call that Y. All right, next we need a free body diagram. And so our free body diagram, we're still working with particles. FBD, free body diagram, is simply going to be that particle P. And we need to put all of our forces on there. And so we know that we have a force due to gravity. So that force is MG, force due to gravity. And then we also have another force, and that's going to be a constraint force. Because remember, this particle, particle P, can only be the distance L from O. And so something has to keep it there, and that's going to be the force F. So we'll draw our force F along the line, along the line of the rod, right here. So in that same direction, roughly. And so we've now put all of our forces that we need onto our, our free body diagram. Um, however, when we use this, we're going to be using this in the context of Newton's second law. And so when we use Newton's second law, we are going to be using F equals M X double dot, F equals M Y double dot. So that means we need to find the components of this force. So let's draw another free body diagram that puts this, the forces onto our particle P into the same directions of our coordinates. So MG is in the same direction of our coordinate y along that same direction and then we'll have two forces that we break our one constraint force f into 
And so we know that these are proportional triangles. So the force to the right is F of X over L. And then the force going up is big F, which is the full constraint force multiplied times the ratio of Y over L. Okay, And that, that simply, that ratio is, is simply telling us about this triangle right here on our diagram. And so using our, our, our related triangles. So let's set up Newton's second law now. And so to set this up, um, we need to apply Newton's second law not one time, but two times, because now we're working in two dimensions. Okay, we're going to use our, our second free body diagram to do this. And so Newton's second law in the x direction is going to be F multiplied times x divided by L is the only force in this horizontal direction. And we know that this is equal to mx double dot. And so then, in the y direction, we have two forces that we need to account for. We have our constraint force that we've drawn up, and we have our force of gravity that's, that's, gone, that's going down. And so for our second application of Newton's second law, it's going to be F times y divided by L, that's in the positive y direction, minus mg, and then this is equal to m times y double dot. Now one of the things to keep in mind here is that we're developing an equation of motion for this system, or equations of motion of, of this system. And so when we're getting the motion of the system, we don't really care about the forces in this system if unless they're an externally applied force. So what I mean by that is that the force that we drew on here, this force F, we put that on there because it's a constraint force. It's holding the particle to the string or holding the particle to the rod. So we really don't care about that force. We don't care what its magnitude is. We only care about the motion that's resulting due to gravity. That's the definition of a simple pendulum. We've got a, a mass particle that's acting in this gravity vector field. And so what we want to do to get rid of F is that we'll just solve for F on both of these sides. So F is equal to m x double dot L over x for our first equation. And so for our second equation, we solve for F, and we'll get F is equal to m y double dot plus m g multiplied times L all divided by y. We'll set these two equal to each other, or set our F's equal to each other, and then when we do that, we'll get m x double dot l over x is equal to m y double dot plus mg multiplied times l divided by y. And then rearrange our terms. x double dot y is equal to x y double dot plus gx. And so you can see now We've got our, our equations of motion now totally in terms of our kinematics. x double dot y is equal to x y double dot plus g times x. So now if we, if we look at this equation here, this equation of motion, we have both an x double dot and we have a y double dot within the same equation. And so what this is telling us is that these two equations are coupled together, okay? And so later on when we're dealing with multi-particle systems, we're going to end up with sometimes multiple equations that have all the same accelerations. But in this case, they're coupled together not because it's two particles that are linked together in a, in a particular way, but instead we've got x double dot and y double dot together. And if we go back up to our drawing of our simple pendulum, our pendulum can move only in a circle, which tells us that the location of y, or the y-coordinate, is dependent upon the x-coordinate, and vice versa. 
So what you should be thinking is there's a constraint in this system. And we've even already used that language before because we had to put a force on there. And we, we've said before in class that all constraints are caused by forces. So we had to model a constraint force and we modeled that as F. So let's take our, our system here and then let's develop our constraint equation. Because we're in the plane now and so we've, we're in a two-dimensional plane but because the coordinate of x is dependent upon y and vice versa, then that tells us intuitively that there's only one degree of freedom in this system. So if we have two dimensions but only one degree of freedom, then we need to come up with our constraint equation. And our constraint equation, which you've seen before, is simply that the length of the rod is connected to those coordinates. And the constraint equation is x squared plus y squared is equal to L squared. And so X and Y are related to each other and when we look at this equation here, right, we're working with Y double dot and X double dot and we need to reduce this equation into an equation in which we only have one second order term. So the process for going about that is we recognize that X and Y are related to each other well, x dot and y dot are also related to each other. So one way that we can get x dot and y dot is to take the time differentiation of our constraint equation. And when we do that, we get 2x multiplied times x dot plus 2y multiplied times y dot is equal to zero because the time differentiation of L squared is going to be zero and so we can drop our twos and so then this becomes our equation where we get x multiplied times x dot plus y multiplied times y dot is equal to zero. Now one thing to note is that this is not a new constraint equation. Okay, let me say that again. We don't now have two constraint equations where we have one on the position and then one on, you know, that has some velocity terms. We only have one constraint equation and then we have another handy equation which we've derived from the constraint equation simply by taking the time derivative. So let's develop another one because we want to get rid of, remember we're, our goal is to get rid of either an x double dot or a y double dot. And so to do that, let's take the time derivative of this equation. So d dt of x, x dot plus y, y dot is equal to zero is going to give us, using the chain rule, we get x dot times x dot plus x times x double dot plus y dot, y dot plus y, y double dot and that's all equal to zero because the time differentiation of zero is zero. And so we can collect our terms, so we'll get x dot squared plus y dot squared plus x times x double dot plus y times y double dot is equal to zero. So now let's take this result and let's plug it into our equation of motion. So starting with our equation of motion we have from the top of the page x double dot y minus x y double dot is equal to gx. And now we're going to take our, our we're going to solve for y double dot and then we're going to put that into this equation of motion. And when we solve for y double dot we get y double dot is equal to negative x dot squared minus y dot squared minus x x double dot divided by y. So we're going to plug this in. And when we plug that in, we get this term, we get this expression, x double dot y minus negative x dot squared minus y dot squared minus x x double dot all divided by y the entire quantity multiplied times x is equal to gx 
And then as we continue to solve, x double dot y plus x x dot squared plus x y dot squared plus x squared x double dot divided by y is equal to gx. And simplify this even further, we get y squared plus x squared multiplied times x double dot plus x times x dot squared plus x y dot squared all divided by y is equal to gx and then finally solve for x double dot and this is equal to gxy minus x times x dot squared minus x times y dot squared all divided by L squared. Should have pointed out earlier this is equal to 1. And so now we have our solution in second order form because we have x double dot is equal to some function of x, of y, of x dot, and y dot, and then the constant g, and then the constant l. And so this is our equation of motion for x double dot. Now there's also an equation of motion for y double dot. So y double dot is equal to negative y x dot squared minus y y dot squared minus x squared g all divided by l squared. All right? Now remember these two equations are coupled together and we can certainly solve for this but we're not going to be able to solve for this by hand. This is, this is a pretty pretty nasty equation and um, also when you're looking at this one of the things that you should notice, and I, I hope that it's obvious, is that when you're looking at this differential equation, x double dot is equal to gxy minus x times x dot squared minus x times y dot squared all divided by l squared. Can you look at that and interpret that equation? And I, I hope that, well I don't know that I hope that your answer is no, but my answer is no. When I look at that, I can't interpret that equation. I can't tell you what's exactly happening in that equation. So, but there's actually quite a bit going on there, and they mention a few of these things in the book. For one thing, that's unstable motion. And the reason why that's unstable motion is because we solved for an inverted pendulum. And if you take that configuration that we sketched at the very beginning and just let it go, it's, it's not going to stay there. It's going to go to another point in which it is stable. So that's the first thing. Um, they also point out in the book um, that it's numerically unstable. And so there, there are some issues there in even solving this numerically, which uh, cast some doubt on the Cartesian coordinates. But more important uh, is that I don't understand the motion, or I can't look at that and actually understand what the motion is. And so this is one of these instances where using Cartesian coordinates isn't really the best option. And so over the next few days, we're going to introduce several different ways to, to look at the coordinates, to change coordinate systems in ways that are not only... They don't, only, they don't only just make the problem easier to solve or easier to set up, um, but they actually give you quite a bit of intuition on what the system is doing. So um, next time, we're going to start introducing vectors. So far, we've been dealing with scalars quite a bit. We're going to introduce the vectors and all the notation that goes with that and um, start solving some, some more interesting problems. I'll see you in class tomorrow.